Feeling tired all the time? It could be anemia. Anemia. I'm Dr. Paul Salazar. I'm Dr. Brad Weening. Welcome to Talking with Docs. We brought in a guest today, Dr. Duncan Rosario. Welcome, Duncan. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. I'm honored to attend. Oh, thank you. Um, you are a general surgeon, and not only do you cause anemia, <laughs> I guess, but you are also an expert in anemia. I think you do some consulting for a company that's developing uh, iron supplements. Is Correct. that true? Correct. Okay, so we've got an expert on anemia. We're going to try and cover it and then focus a little bit on one type of anemia. Yes, yeah, so we'll talk about what anemia is, the different types of anemia, how you diagnose it, and how you treat it. And there's a specific group of people that are maybe not totally recognized or not getting the attention that they deserve mm -hmm. when it comes to anemia. So let's start at the very beginning. Falling between the cracks. Falling between the cracks. What actually is anemia? So uh, a great question. Um, uh, anemia refers to an uh, inadequate amount of hemoglobin in our body and hemoglobin is the protein that allows us to transport oxygen. So as you know, we need oxygen for cellular processes. Basically, we need oxygen to make energy. And uh, to make hemoglobin, we need iron. Right. But one step before uh, anemia, which is low hemoglobin level, is the issue of iron deficiency. Okay. And the challenge that uh, we have in North America is we're very good at diagnosing anemia because everybody knows you check your hemoglobin. If your hemoglobin is below 120 grams per liter for women, 130 grams per liter for men, you're anemic. Right. But the challenge is people become symptomatic when they're iron deficient, which happens before they get anemic. Okay. Oh. Yeah, and, and the test for iron deficiency is ferritin. So ferritin is a protein that transports iron. And unfortunately, rarely is ferritin checked. Okay. And ferritin is such an important protein in the transport of uh, iron. The Ministry of Health last year revised the ferritin level at which the diagnosis of iron deficiency is made. So they, they raised it to capture more people. They raised it to 30 micrograms per liter. Okay. And in some studies, it should even be higher. Okay. So, uh, iron deficiency happens well before anemia, and iron deficiency produces lots of symptoms. Brain fog, fatigue, lots of changes. Yeah, so, so let's start, let's go back a little bit. Yeah, so you said a lot. <laughs> <laughs> right out the gate. So someone that's anemic, so let's start at the beginning. What is someone going to feel? Why are they going to go to their doctor? Why is their doctor going to think that they might have anemia? Right at the, or in the history. Deficiency. Or iron deficiency. So, so the, the standard, the most common symptom is fatigue. Okay. So uh, patients will say, I, I feel so tired, I barely get through the day, I hate getting out of bed. I think I have anemia or yeah. iron deficiency. Everybody, everybody I know has yeah. anemia. Okay. Right. All yeah. right, so those are the symptoms, right? Okay. Um, let's see, you have those symptoms and you go see your doctor and say, these are my symptoms. What's the doctor gonna do in the first visit to help get a diagnosis? Because that's those are quite the common symptoms for a lot of disorders. Ab absolutely, so uh, of course the, the standard thing that a physician should do, take a proper history to understand the context in which these uh, symptoms are happening, uh, examine the patient, yes. and uh, based on the age of the patient, they would typically order some routine screening blood work. Okay, so with physical exam, other than unless you're like extremely pale, so this would be a more advanced sign, is Correct. there anything that your family doctor could see or that you could see if you're looking in the mirror at yourself saying, hey, I'm wondering, maybe I have iron deficiency or maybe yeah. I'm anemic. Is there anything you could see? So uh, apart from uh, pallor, so uh, pale in color, okay. uh, dry skin, uh, uh, there are nail changes that happen uh, as well. Uh, not a lot of changes on physical examination. It really is how patients feel, you okay. know, uh, uh, brain fog, difficulty concentrating, uh, difficulty getting through the day just okay. on an energy level. Right. Okay, so then some tests. We order some blood tests. You mentioned some already. Hemoglobin, that's probably the most common one we check for. Uh, it's probably the most common blood test ordered, I would uh, imagine. Uh, uh, one of, anyways. And so you're looking for low hemoglobin. Okay, and you would mentioned the cutoffs, 130 for a man, 120, whoa, 120 for a woman. Correct. Uh, so below that, we say you are anemic, okay. Um, any other blood tests? You mentioned ferritin. Yeah, so ferritin is probably the most important test because right. the incidence of iron deficiency is twice that of the incidence of anemia. And okay. so people become symptomatic once they're iron deficient. And so we need to screen for iron deficiency. And the way we do that is with this blood test called ferritin, which unfortunately isn't as well known and isn't commonly used for screening purposes when it really should be. So what you're saying is someone might get a CBC or a, a complete blood count and they say, hey, your hemoglobin's normal. It would be a potential mistake to say, hey, you're fine. We don't have to worry about this at all. 
unless they ordered the ferritin. So the ferritin would be low. And is that the, is that the only test to measure that protein or essentially the amount of iron that's not just in your blood, but bound to protein? Are there other tests that you can do? So, so it's probably the best test. Okay. Uh, the, the, there's another test called transferrin saturation. Right. So uh, TSAT or transferrin saturation uh, is a helpful test in a subset of patients who have inflammation. So if you've okay. had surgery, if you have uh, uh, Crohn's disease, if you have uh, rheumatoid arthritis, if you have medical conditions that produce inflammation, that uh, these uh, inflammatory states can cause your ferritin level to go up abnormally. Okay. So you can have a normal ferritin but still be anemic. Uh, and you uh, diagnose that with transferrin saturation, which is low, under 20%, if you are actually iron deficient. Okay. So, so that's uh, the third test. That's that's like a a false, you can get a false negatively normal, a false negative for that test. Absolutely. Okay, so those are some, you're, you're going to get some tests ordered. Now, can we just quickly talk about the different types of anemia? Because not all anemia is iron deficiency anemia. Uh, absolutely. Iron deficiency accounts for about 75% so of, uh, of anemia. So it's certainly the most common. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can have challenges from the production of red blood cells, right. which is, uh, there are conditions called thalassemias, where you don't produce uh, red blood cells in the appropriate quantity. You can have abnormalities where your blood cells break down, uh, hemolysis conditions. Okay, uh, so aplastic anemia, hemolytic anemia. Uh, you can have issues of blood loss. And so uh, as a general surgeon, um, I treat a lot of colon cancer. And right. so when patients have polyps or cancers in their colon, these polyps bleed and uh, you lose blood and that's another uh, way that people get anemic. And I would say one of the other most common ones, non-surgical ones, would be the normal loss of menstruation. Absolutely. If you right. look Not at, that it's uh, a pathological condition, but... Uh, absolutely. If you look at uh, uh, women in Canada, so you know Canada is a developed country. Um, Michelle Schultzberg, who's a very uh, well-renowned uh, hematologist from the University of Toronto, yeah. demonstrated in her 2022 study that 38% of women in Canada are reproductive age. So almost 40% of women between you know, 13 and 50 are iron deficient. Wow. That's a high number. That's yeah, a high number. And she also demonstrated that almost three quarters of women in Canada who are pregnant in their third trimester are iron deficient. And so wow. iron deficiency is a huge problem, predominantly affecting women okay. um, in, in, in the world and even in the developed world. So it's a significant problem producing significant disability. We talk a lot about gender equality too, and sometimes um, issues of, of women in medicine don't get investigated as aggressively or researched as aggressively, and, and thankfully this is something that's coming to light. Absolutely, and unfortunately often research follows the money. Right. And so the, the money, whether it's uh, uh, management of cholesterol, management of uh, uh, conditions that maybe predominantly affect men, right. uh, the, the money unfortunately dictates where a lot of the research dollars go. Okay. And uh, if you look at anemia, you know, iron deficiency is the third most common cause of disability in the world. Wow. That's Up to three billion people in the world are anemic, according to the World Health Organization. We should have made this video a long time ago. <laughs> I agree. Way before our Bunyan video. That's for sure. Okay. So it was very common. Uh, and one more type, I think we didn't mention anemia of chronic disease. Correct. Uh, so we see that very commonly, patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, patients with inflammatory conditions, yeah. uh, diabetes, kidney disease, kidney disease, yeah. cancer, cancer. Yeah. Right. chronic okay. so disease. Those, I think those are all just to jump back and cover all the types of yeah. anemia. And now, like you said, the most common iron deficiency. All right. So let's say you've been diagnosed with iron deficiency anemia. Okay. Or, um, What's, what treatment options do you have? So uh, the treatment options are basically divided into oral iron right. and uh, intravenous iron. Right. So conventionally, we start with uh, what are called iron salts, so ferrous sulfate, ferrous gluconate. Uh, then there are uh, iron agents involving iron bound to uh, sugar-like compounds. There's uh, 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 oral iron available, which is essentially uh, bovine blood, so it's heme-based. Okay. iron. 
Uh, there are, so there are a variety of oral agents. The yep. challenge with most oral agents is less than 10% gets absorbed. The body blocks a lot of uh, oral iron absorption and the iron that's not absorbed stays in your intestine, it oxidizes, and it produces a lot of GI side effects that make oral iron intolerable for a lot of patients. So it rusts in your gut? <laughs> well, in, in essence, it oxidizes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when we do colonoscopies, uh, if patients are on iron, you see this black tarry deposit inside the colon. Right. It affects your microbiome. It makes you feel oh, very oh. unwell with nausea and abdominal pain imagine. and diarrhea. And so a lot of people don't tolerate conventional oral iron. It's so oh. funny that something that's so crucial for us to live is so hard to absorb, right? Like, to right. Get, I mean, you think about trying to get iron. Like, what are you going to do? Go eat a bike? Well, and, and you wonder, too, if some of it's protective because, obviously, iron um, contamination or toxicity can, to our bodies. We have too much iron. This is a problem as well. So some of it might be protective. But Absolutely. let's talk a little bit about iron. So, um, so you're talking about the cheaper kind of versions, typically the Correct. ones that are readily available that people are buying over the counter are quite cheap. Um, but there are some things that affect the rates at which our iron is absorbed. So uh, some things that help it and some things that uh, hurt it. Can uh, we talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So um, things such as vitamin C uh, right. aids in the absorption of iron. Uh, there are forms of iron, uh, the uh, animal products, so meat and fish uh, and chicken, uh, provide a, a type of iron called heme. Right. And the body is much better at absorbing iron in the form of heme right. than it is absorbing iron in the form of iron salts present in plants. Right. Right. Uh, everyone wants their iron, including the plants, and they, they, they don't give it up very easily. Right. Okay. So from plants there, broccoli, what are some of the foods of plants? Yeah, so, so green leafy vegetables are probably the, the number one. Um, but tofu, tempeh, beans, chickpeas, lentils, like they all have iron in them, Absolutely. but they're not quite as bioavailable. So yes, pairing them with something that has vitamin C. And then the things that have been shown um, to reduce your iron absorption are things like caffeine. We just did a video oh, about yeah. caffeine. Absolutely. So with your meal, regardless of whether it's animals or, or plants, maybe avoid the coffee or the tea or your Coca-Cola yeah. with that meal. Dr. Zalzal on the weekends. Um, well, and luckily, I eat chicken, <laughs> chicken wings. That's right. With the Coca-Cola. You get a pair of chickens. Kind of balances it. Perfect. So and it has the heme-based diet. So I'm even. On, um, yes. Perfect. But yes, having a typically a well-balanced um, uh, diet still will protect you. But if you are deficient, the issue is, as much as we make good food choices, we add the vitamin C, we avoid the caffeine, our body simply can't catch up, particularly for women that are menstruating or having heavy periods. Absolutely. And the challenge, of course, is uh, most women who are menstruating are in a ne negative iron balance. Right. They lose more than they can absorb. And so, you know, we mentioned the conventional iron salts. Right. Uh, in Europe, developed about 20 years ago, is a, a novel form of iron called sucrosomial iron. Okay. And this Italian uh, nutritional company discovered that if you take iron, you grind it into nanoparticles and you coat it with a sucrose uh, fatty layer called a sucrester. Okay. It's called sucrosomial iron, that it bypasses conventional absorption and uh, you get virtually no GI side effects. Okay. And it mimics the uh, iron uh, uh, effect seen with the best form of iron therapy that we currently have, which is intravenous iron. And that's something that's used... Uh, not very commonly, but it's actually the most effective way to get iron levels up. Intravenously. Okay, so a couple quick questions about that. So then, A, first you said it's been around for 20 years. Correct. Why is it taking so long to get to North America? Mainly business reasons. Not uh, the ocean, it's not the cause. No, no, we have planes, we've got okay. ships, we can okay. ship these things, but uh, uh, it's been in development. It's the number one iron supplement in Italy right now and in many European countries. Okay. And it's coming to North America uh, this fall. In the fall, okay, oh, okay. so this was a Health Canada approved. Absolutely. Okay. FDA approved in the uh, States too? Uh, yes, FDA approved as wow. well. Okay. And so um, how much better is it at getting iron to our body? And proportionately, how much more does it cost compared? Because typically, cheaper iron, maybe not as good to absorb. If you're like, yeah, but I can't afford the expensive iron. And if you could True. just compare it to IV iron for me. Absolutely. So the, uh, the European studies have demonstrated that this new form of iron called sucrosomial iron is equivalent to intravenous iron. So okay. intravenous wow. iron is sort of the gold standard. Uh, as a rule, if you're, let's say your hemoglobin is 80, if you get a dose of intravenous iron, your hemoglobin will be 120 in a month. Whoa. So it takes so uh, this new agent called sucrosomial iron will mimic that. It'll produce the same increase in hemoglobin over a month that intravenous iron does. Okay. Now, any of our viewers who've had intravenous uh, iron therapy will 
will know that there's some side effects with that. A Holy smoke. Absolutely. So while intravenous iron is highly effective at yeah. increasing iron levels, uh, there are some uh, challenges. It's expensive. You know, it's up to $400 for a dose plus medical daycare costs. But the, the big issue with intravenous iron is the incidence of anaphylaxis. Right. And so we You're don't... allergic to iron? Unfortunately, uh, some people get anaphylactic type reactions to intravenous iron. So wow. to administer IV iron, you need to be in a monitored setting, a yeah. medical daycare setting where you can be uh, resuscitated if you have an anaphylactic reaction. Fortunately, it's uncommon. Sure. Uh, but at the moment, uh, intravenous iron is the best way we have of repleting iron stores yeah. and uh, addressing significant and iron deficiency. And they feel pretty crummy after. I've, I've seen people who have just like had to, wait, I got to go sit down, like yeah. after their iron infusions, like hours after. Oh, yes. interesting. Yeah. And then approximate cost comparisons of the cheapest not great solution to the oral to the IV? So the, the cheapest iron, uh, ferrous salts such as ferrous sulfate or ferrous gluconate, uh, approximately 5 to $10 for a month of treatment. Okay. The most expensive irons are the heme-based irons or sucrosomial iron, right. which are about 55 to $60 okay. a month. Okay. And do you have to be on them forever or is it going to be just get your hemoglobin up and then? Well, it depends. If the iron deficiency is a short-term issue related to I had a hip replacement right. and I'm anemic for a period of time, then you would need to be treated only for a short period of time. If you're a, a menstruating woman uh, uh, and you're not tolerating uh, uh, conventional iron salts, if you're not getting enough iron from a balanced diet, then some women need to be on iron supplementation for the course of their uh, life that's until a double whammy, isn't it? The, yeah. the menstruating, I mean, like you're getting, because that's just every month that you're going to be losing. going losing. And, and, and unfortunately, that puts them in a, in a continuous net uh, negative iron balance until menopause. Or until you get pregnant. And then when you're pregnant, you get the anemia as well. Yeah. Even though exactly. your oxygen, dema oxygen demands have gone up through the roof. And you yes. had mentioned before that, like when, before we started filming, that the anemia in pregnancy has very negative consequences for the unborn baby. Absolutely. Dr. Schultzberg uh, in her study demonstrated that up to three quarters of uh, women in Canada in their third trimester are iron deficient. And wow. it's uh, well uh, understood that uh, uh, anemia produces neurocognitive deficits in children yeah. and it produces poorer uh, outcomes in pregnancy. And wow. so it's very important to address anemia in pregnancy so as well. So in place in the world where, where this, where the fancier iron supplementation is available, are they finding that the pregnancies are better outcomes? They've demonstrated increases in birth weight associated yeah. with the use of sucrosomial iron. Uh, and so there are definite uh, uh, clear improvements uh, demonstrated with uh, addressing anemia in pregnancy. Okay. We should put a link in the description about sucrosomial. Yes, just to this uh, type of iron oil. We'll do that for that reveal for sure. And when yeah. are we anticipating it's going to be in North uh, So available in the third quarter of this year. So uh, by Is September. it available in the U.S. already? Or? Uh, it's available in the U.S. already okay. and widely available in Europe. And as both of you mentioned, uh, I'm a consultant to the, com to the company that's yeah. bringing this into Canada. Yeah. And so, the, of course, there's a clear conflict of interest on my part. But sure. my standard recommendation when it comes to medical therapy is that patients should use the, the cheapest, safest therapy that addresses their problem right. with the least possible side effects. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, my standard recommendation. Agreed, and we say the same thing. Hey, yeah. do, do as little as you can, but as much as you have to kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Sage Absolutely. advice. That is. Now, well. now, now you know. Um, critical message to take home today is if you're having some of these symptoms, talk to your doctor. If your doctor thinks you might be anemic or have iron deficiency, they're going to investigate it and then talk to you about all the different options. And keep in mind, it is underdiagnosed. Yeah, so. and, and yeah, for, and for the women that are watching, for sure, if you are a menstruating woman or a pregnant woman, please give this some consideration if you, if you think you might have this issue. And if you like this video, please like it. Um, subscribe to our channel and share it with someone that you might be dealing with this. And remember, you are in charge of your own health. And thanks to Dr. Rosario for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank uh, you. Very kind of you. We'll see you next time.